In the beginning, Egypt was the land of the arcane. Its shriveled mummies had long been the pride of European apothecaries and physicians alike. Since the 16th century, ships departing from the Egyptian port of Alexandria often smuggled mummy corpses into Europe. Some were then ground into a powder and used in medical concoctions, while others were sold intact to amateur physicians and eccentric gentlemen. Lucky friends and colleagues might then receive an invitation for a morbid unwrapping party, where new acquaintances, both living and dead, were formed. For those who police the imagined boundaries of Western art and civilization, however, the mystical wonders of ancient Egypt fell far short of the classical standard. In the words of a 1777 guidebook to the British Museum, Greece and Rome were the places where, quote, all the polite arts were carried to the highest perfection and where wit and elegance resided. They stood in stark contrast to the artifacts from Egypt, where, quote, a deity was represented with the head of a dog and a lion was the most respectable inhabitant of one city. Another well-known collector declared that there never appears one single figure that shows anything of art or good work. Their limbs are stiff and ill-proportioned, their bodies awkward, shapeless, and far inferior to the life. No people living had ever so enormous and perverse a fancy as they appear to have had. They really aimed at something that was hideous, deformed, and monstrous. The message was clear. Ancient Egypt did not belong in the Hall of Fine Arts. Then came the Rosetta Stone. Discovered in 1799 by a French engineer tasked with the repair of a fortress wall in the coastal town of Rosetta, the stone was found to be inscribed with three ancient scripts, the original hieroglyphs, a cursive script known as Demotic, and Greek. Though the hieroglyphs were then impenetrable and Demotic was still a work in progress, most educated European scholars could read Greek. The first person to attempt a translation was Thomas Young, a British scholar. By isolating repetitive and distinct words such as king and Egypt, he began to show that the hieroglyphs represented nothing more than the mundane sounds of everyday words, not abstract ideas of the occult that many had once thought likely. For Young, however, this breakthrough was sullied by the realization that the words of the pharaohs were still a product of their time and place. All the inscriptions on temples and the manuscripts found with mummies, he said, appear to relate to their ridiculous rites and ceremonies. I see nothing that looks like history. Fortunately, others did. In 1822, the French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion successfully deciphered the hieroglyphs, capping more than two decades of intense philological study made possible by the Rosetta Stone. The unlocking of the hieroglyphs brought about a dramatic shift in Western perceptions of Egypt. Once the land of mystical curiosities, it was now shown to have a lengthy history, and that history could only be written by those in possession of the knowledge yielded by the Rosetta Stone. This meant the French and British, who continued to vie for cultural influence in Egypt long after the withdrawal of their military forces. Much as with ancient Greece and Rome, the desire to claim the mantle of most scientifically enlightened empire in the present required intellectual mastery over all the great civilizations of the past, if not on the ground, then at least in their museums and libraries back home. As a result, with the sudden addition of 3,600 years of recorded history to their name, the pharaohs were granted entrance into the exclusive club of Western civilization and redefined as the predecessors to the Greeks. This change was soon reflected in European museums. Instead of comparing Egyptian art unfavorably with what was often referred to as the faultless representations of human form and marble of the Greeks, the pharaohs were now seen in a new light, on par with the Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans as the most distinguished voices of the ancient world. In the 1830s, for the first time, visitors to the British Museum were no longer served with a pejorative critique of Egyptian art as representing an overly stiff, monstrous curiosity. Instead, they were now told, as in the words of one guidebook, that Egypt was, quote, the source from which the arts of sculpture and of painting, and perhaps even the sciences, were handed to the Greeks, and then from the Greeks to us. It is the alpha of the history of art. This was a lofty promotion indeed. We call this promotion the invention of Egyptology. 
its practitioners, Egyptologists, legitimize their studies by attempting to purge their subject of anything that smacked of literary hyperbole or mystical indulgence. The most famous example of this shift can be seen in the evolving identity of Belzoni's so-called Memnum Head, acquired by Giovanni Belzoni in 1816 and installed in the British Museum before Champollion's decipherment of the hieroglyphs, it was given a name derived from Homer's epic poem, the Iliad. But now that Egyptologists could read the hieroglyphs, they knew exactly whose head this was, and how wrong Homer had been. It was Ramses II, the third pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, who ruled Egypt for more than six decades in the 13th century BC. Thus did Belzoni's most famous find enter the jealously guarded domain of the Egyptologists, who were quick to spurn the Italian's lack of scholarly credentials and unseemly indulgence in the thrill of the expedition. But as Belzoni was quick to discover, the thrill of the expedition, when properly packaged and sold, could prove quite lucrative indeed. As narrated in episode 5, upon his return to London, Belzoni organized a popular exhibition in which the general public could pay to walk through his own colorful reconstruction of the tomb of Seti I. One man saw in the exhibition, quote, the most gratifying consequence of exploring the remains of ancient Egypt, and delighted in the memory of sitting in them as in the realities themselves, among the presence of objects that fill the mind with pleasing wonder. Another visitor described the, quote, vivid colors and extraordinary figures on the walls and ceilings, the mummies scattered in various places, the statues of fine earth, which feed the imagination by the strangeness and stillness of the scene, and the partly ascertained and partly unknown nature of the objects. This was a feast for the senses, not for the brain. This was Egyptomania. Though most people who have taken an interest in the history of Egypt like to imagine that they are doing so through the respectable lens of Egyptology, they are in fact much more likely to be indulging in the less substantive yet hugely entertaining lens of Egyptomania. Belzoni's London Panorama repackaged and sold for a commercial profit the exotic allure of ancient Egypt as a sensual experience. Along the way, much information about the lives, beliefs, and practices of the ancient Egyptians was presented, but little is retained. Belzoni knew his audience was paying primarily to see scary mummies, strange hieroglyphs, and exotic paintings. Not to listen to a boring lecture on the funerary rites of Egyptian priests during the 15th dynasty. Historical knowledge was incidental to the chief goal of Egyptomania. To see something bizarre and fantastic, and then to tell one's friends about it. Before long, advances in technology and transportation made possible a stunning expansion in the geographic scope and reach of Egyptomania. Once confined to the ticket-buying public of major European cities, by the 1830s, Egyptomania was being exported back into Egypt by travelers who took advantage of new steamships and trains, where it once took more than a month for wealthy travelers on the Grand Tour to cross from the southern coast of France to the northern coast of Egypt, a growing demographic of somewhat more modest means could now travel all the way from London to Cairo in just 15 days. This growing influx of travelers facilitated the construction of an extensive tourist infrastructure in Egypt. Hotels, guides, boats, and servants could all be hired through tourist agencies that catered exclusively to Western clients. With such expendable income came a marked imbalance in relations between the tourists and Egyptians. As late as 1821, Belzoni still felt compelled to dress in the garb of local Muslims and shelter his wife from the public gaze. Just ten years later, however, Western tourists felt completely at ease in dressing exactly as they might back home, with little expectation that they would have to brave the discomfort of local society and its customs. The near-simultaneous creation of Egyptology and Egyptomania introduced an awkward and at times uncomfortable dynamic between foreigners and the modern-day Egyptians among whom they traveled and interacted for the two sides could not have subscribed to a collection of aesthetic and ideological priorities that were more at odds with one another. Westerners viewed Egypt almost exclusively through the lens of its pharaonic past, be it in the form of elite narratives of Western civilization peddled by Egyptologists, or through the enduring appeal of an exotic funhouse made respectable by the commercial packaging of Egyptomania. 
But for most Egyptians, the civilization of the pharaohs was viewed as little more than a pagan preamble to the Age of Islam, a topic we will treat more in depth in episode 11. Furthermore, most Egyptians did not identify in any meaningful way with the Age of the Pharaohs, whose people spoke, dressed, wrote, and worshipped in ways regarded with indifference at best and outright hostility at worst. It is thus little wonder that most Egyptians felt no compunction about reusing ancient monuments for fertilizer or as free construction material for new buildings, much as the Rosetta Stone had been used. And yet if they wanted to profit from the new infusion of money brought into their country by Egyptology and Egyptomania, they could do so only by means of the preservation and repackaging of these sites as tourist and scholarly commodities, with themselves as middlemen. But what about the Ottoman elites? Unlike their subjects, the rulers of Cairo and Constantinople were burdened not only with the awkward cultural and economic considerations, but also with the high-stakes arena of international politics as well. How would they respond to the rise of Egyptology and Egyptomania, both of which depended upon access to their realms, yet consistently portrayed the modern-day descendants of those realms as unworthy of their glorious pasts? Please join us next time as we explore the role of the Sultan and the Pasha in Episode 7 of Indiana Jones in History.